Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Well, a wonderful good evening and welcome to the official launch of Plug and Play Maritime. My name is Zach, I'll be the host for tonight, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Just also in the sense of Antwerp, uh, when I got off the train this morning, and you have to know I come from Berlin, not exactly a city that is known for its great architecture, I was just blown away what a beautiful city you have here. You have such great architecture here, I can honestly say that with jealousy. And I was really enjoying the walk here, looking at these amazing buildings, and just the way you transformed the harbor here with that amazing cute building out there, it's beautiful. Now, not being here as a tourist, but as the host um, for the kickoff of like, uh, the first innovation platform around the shipping industry here in Europe, I also know that is because of the century-long history of Antwerp as one of the most significant ports in Europe and around the world. That has been probably the factor for making Antwerp uh, that, um, yeah, that prosperous and enabling all the science, the creativity, and this beautiful architecture you have here. Now, I think that is, on the one hand, good news, that it comes from the shipping industry, as well as a challenge. Good news it is, because the shipping industry is literally one of the oldest in the world. I mean, it's been not around for decades or centuries, but really millennia. I think whenever the first guy started hollowing out a tree and threw it in the ocean, it's a long time ago. So I'm pretty sure you can be comfortable that it will be around for a long, long time, and will, you will have the opportunity to have a prosperous city here in Antwerp. Now, the challenge is, being around that long, it has seen its fair share of disruptions. Disruptions that now just are laughable if you look back. I mean, you know, going from the pedal to the sail now just looks with like the perspective of today, just really laughable. It was a problem for the guy back then whose job it was to actually make those pedals out of wood. Going from sails to the steam engine, going to diesel, uh, I mean, that's not so long ago. And now, something that I think has never been imaginable in the whole history of shipping, that soon we might have vessels that do not have a captain, but steer completely by themselves over the ocean. I'm not even sure if you're still allowed to call it a ship them, or if, like, really the captains would take that personally. Um, that's just really the um, long horizon, I think, when we really talk about autonomous ships. Um, but if we're a little bit closer, there's also like the nifty things that are disrupting at the moment. Of course, you need to go from a lot of paper to digitalize processes and move on. Now, that's a challenge. But I think it's a challenge you're all very eager to embrace, because that's why you're here tonight and you come together, either representing institutions or corporates, to create an ecosystem and to create a platform where you can disrupt your own business and really create that innovative spirit you need in order to stay in business for the next decades and centuries and for keeping up also in the end this beautiful city that's so enjoyable to visit and of course beyond all the borders. So it does take a lot of people. It does take a lot of people to come here to create this ecosystem and some of those of you who will be part of Plug and Play will see on stage tonight, we cannot have all of them on stage, but we really want to make sure you see some of the faces, some of the spirit and some of the ideas they'll bring into the platform. That means you need to like, hold fast to your chair and really be ready for a very fast succession of people here on stage who are going to give you a lot of input, a lot of different topics. And since we're probably going to overstretch the program anyway, I'll cut myself short and let's just start right away. So let's kick it off. 
And for that, I really want to welcome on stage those two guys whose honor it actually will be to make sure that Plug and Play Maritime hits the street running. Welcome, David and Zalar. So, for those of you who do not know uh, Salar and David, um, Salar actually has himself a career in the shipping business, so he really comes from the industry. Hence, he also is the director um, of Plug and Play Hamburg, which has its focus on supply chain and logistics and covers the shipping industry consequently as well. And um, David actually comes from Startup Autobahn in Stuttgart, so the platform focusing on the automotive industry, um, which is a great experience to bring uh, dealing with a legacy in a, completely, um, yeah, tr in a complete transformation. So maybe, David, we can start with you. Um, I know this whole thing started because some people from Antwerp actually visited Startup Autobahn in Stuttgart and then got inspired to create a program that caters to the shipping industry here. So for those of you in the room who were not there on that journey, how would you describe Plug and Play? What is it in a nutshell? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for, for having us. On behalf of Plug and Play, also welcome from our side. We're super excited for our very first event uh, to finally have a public event here in Antwerp on the launch of our Plug and Play Maritime program. Um, I'm David, together with my uh, colleague Salah. I'm co-leading co the program here. Super excited about today. Um, regarding your question, yes, it started in Stuttgart, but I have the honor to also uh, show you a little bit what Plug and Play is all about, uh, where, we are, where we started, where we're going, what do we do. Um, and then I hand it over to my colleague Salar. So quick intro of Plug and Play. Some of you might be familiar with what we do. We have our roots in the Silicon Valley uh, in, in a place called Sunnyvale. Our founder and CEO, Saeed, he bought a building and he was lucky enough to have uh, famous tenants in this building and he was also able to invest in, in those companies. Uh, companies who are quite famous in the meanwhile, uh, PayPal, Dropbox, Logitech, I and mean, in the meanwhile, we also built a, a large portfolio of, uh, of famous companies, unicorns, over 10 of them. You see them on the right side. So we started as an investor. We started to build ecosystems. We started to, to grow our network in Silicon Valley. And then we also scaled this on a global scale. And what do we do in a nutshell? We have our three pillars, accelerator programs. We have them all over the world, 60 uh, in total. We also do corporate innovation, so we supercharge and we help our corporate partners along their innovation strategy in all kind of different, different varieties. And lastly, what I just mentioned, we're one of the most active VCs in the world with over 200 investments per year. And if you look on a global scale, this is where we have our physical offices, especially over the last four to five years, we had a rapid growth, we opened up probably a new office uh, per quarter. Um, the journey of the maritime programs uh, in Antwerp started in Stuttgart when we had a visit um, and we, got, we introduced uh, the program in Stuttgart also to some of the folks who are here in the, in the room today. And then after one and a half years, COVID was in between, uh, we managed to land here and we're super excited to be here. And what is, it, what is it all about? That's why I'm handing it over to my colleague Salar. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good, good recap. Um, so what was today about? Today we had our selection day, um, which is basically the kickoff, the start of our program, our maritime program, the very first one. In brackets, I'm very, very proud of that. As you said, my roots are in the maritime industry, and it's great to have this. Um, so the, the um, selection day is basically the day where we have invited a pre-selected number of startups, international startups from more than eight different countries, uh, to come and present their ideas in front of our corporate partners. And uh, a variety of them will then be selected uh, to the next process where we uh, foster innovation within the organizations of our partners and we try to achieve pilot projects and more even that, up to the point of implementation. Um, the next steps for us uh, is hard work, a lot of hard work, uh, but afterwards, hopefully next year, a very cel uh, celebrating uh, expo uh, event, the expo event will basically be the graduation event where we showcase the results, showcase what has been done, the learnings, the failures, everything which is uh, yeah, connected to this innovation path and roadmap. And um, yeah, we're very excited for this. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, our corporate partners for really engaging with us here and uh, being the founders of this platform. This is your platform, um, so it's it's really the success is all of us together to, to, to be made. And yeah, we'd like to thank everyone and thank also for the startups and the guests that came here. It's exciting to see in-person people again, uh, something that we haven't done since a while. So thanks a lot uh, for coming and 
yeah, get inspired uh, for, um, for the next journey. Well, thanks to you, Salar and David, for giving us this brief pitch on Black and Play. I know you're eager to meet everyone later on, and hence you kept it really short and crisp, so we get through our program uh, on a fast speed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I mentioned it already, the significance of the shipping industry, not only for Antwerp, but for Belgium as such. I think there's over 60,000 jobs that are in this industry currently, and you are aware of these numbers, but I still want to mention them anyway, because they are so stunning. Now, just within 250 kilometers around Antwerp, you have five capitals of Europe. If you go a little bit further, 500 kilometers, you have 60 percent of the European purchasing power just within 500 kilometers. And that is what you're tipping into with the ecosystem here, with the shipping industry. So that's enormous. And of course, that means that uh, why Antwerp is heavily invested in keeping literally the industry afloat and why it's also so integral to have the city on board on a platform such as this. And hence, I'm very honored that tonight we have uh, Vice Mayor Claude Marinauer here because he's actually res responsible specifically for econo economy, um, for corporates, for industry and for innovation. And he's going to set the context again of Antwerp, the shipping industry, um, in the context of this platform. Very honored to have him here in the house. Welcome, Vice Mayor Claude Marinauer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to speak to you here at the Plug and Play Maritime Kickoff. It's my pleasure to introduce briefly the many wonders the city of Antwerp has to offer to the world. Antwerp plays a particularly important role in encouraging innovation. For many years, the city has been firmly committed to stimulating ecosystems for innovation by bringing together capital, large, and small companies, as well as specialized knowledge institutions in the field of digital innovation, circular economy, and health. These powerful ecosystems develop innovations for the traditional Antwerp business clusters, such as the port, the chemical industry, and this solid foundation, together with strong ambitions and an open innovation culture, have made Antwerp the ideal starting point for innovative companies. Our role, ladies and gentlemen, as a local government is to strengthen this market dynamics and to act as a reliable partner and as a matchmaker. Today, we take this even further. We are very proud to be part of and to be the home base for Plug and Play Maritime, a new and exciting ecosystem specific for the maritime industry. The goals are clear. Together with the other founding partners, the Port of Antwerp, the Compagnie Maritime Belge, Euronav, DXC Technology, we want to realize a safer, a smarter, a greener maritime industry. Not only for Antwerp, but for the global maritime industry. For the city of Antwerp, plug and play maritime is a valuable next step to make Antwerp one of the most innovative cities in the world. New disruptive ideas will arise here in Antwerp. Vibrant collaborations and new companies will start here in Antwerp. Innovative and sustainable technologies will be developed here in Antwerp. Plug and Play Maritime will be a flagship project with international appearance. We, the city of Antwerp, would like to thank the other founding partners and the Plug and Play organization for starting this exciting new journey with us. To the international startups who will participate in the Plug and Play Maritime Acceleration Program, I would like to say welcome. Antwerp was and is open for business. So let me finish by saying, let's plug and play. Thank you very much.
Thanks a lot, Mr. Vice Mayor Claude Marinauer. Well, um, it's funny, I'm from Berlin, as I said, and if you look at German corporates, um, for a long time in the past years, there were this ritual of um, corporates who want to tap into the startup culture. They send a delegation to the Silicon Valley and they go on sort of like a tech safari, innovation safari around the valley. And um, they look into companies, of course, they stop by Facebook. Um, of course, they also stop by, by one of these literal founder garages that Bill started Microsoft in, for example. And it's very easy if you look at this garage myth that um, you always think, oh, it only takes one brilliant mind, one guy who comes up with an idea and he establishes a completely new industry. And it's very easy to forget that behind that one person is a huge ecosystem. It's investors, it's research institutions, it's companies, it's um, yeah, like the young talent, um, as Mr. Marinauer said, who we want to attract. And all those really need to come together in close vicinity, have chance encounters, be willing to engage with each, uh, with each other and to talk to each other. And I think if you say that, for example, it takes a, a whole village to raise a child, it probably takes a whole ecosystem such as yours to raise an Elon or a Steve or a Bill. And uh, that is exactly um, the message that our next speaker has, Daniel Bataille. He's the Vice President of Global Operations at Freitos, so an, an online marketplace, actually the first of its kind for international freight. A lot of their first customers were from um, the um, air cargo industry or the air industry, and um, he really le learned his lessons, how tough it can be to turn around a legacy industry and to work against this inherent inertia and get things moving, get things to speed, and um, really get corporates to collaborate together. And from this learnings, he will share now. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we go. Startups love to throw these taglines around all the time. And don't get me wrong, Fredos, where I work, does it as well. Uh, they're cute, they're catchy, but ultimately they're not true. Right? There's, there's a tremendous amount of technology that's used in freight. If you look at any part of the supply chain industry, be it in pricing, sales, or operations, there's always tech at play. It's just really complicated and hard to piece it all together. Images like these of today can be a bit scary, right? Rising prices of ocean freight or congestion at ports. But we have this kind of visibility thanks to technology. And the fact that the $19 trillion industry of freight has been able to sustain itself even today in times of crisis shows just how strong technology can be in um, preventing any kind of collapse. Right? Ultimately, our grocery stores are still um, filled with um, filled shelves. So it's not about technology versus no technology. Right? It's about how we use that technology, how we leverage it. I'm here today to make the case for Maritime's external collaboration and share some lessons from technology and uh, also air freight. My name is Daniel Batayer, as you heard, um, and I made a similar journey myself. So I used to work for DHL, then I was a management consultant uh, working with the US Department of Transportation before eventually finding my way to, to Fredos six years ago, where I'm now the vice president of global operations for our software business. Um, I'm married, I have a couple kids, and we live in Barcelona. But it's actually a real pleasure to be here in, in Belgium because I was born and raised here. So that's uh, it's nice to be back. So um, before I dive into today's topic, I thought I'd give everyone a, an intro of the Fredos Group in case you're not familiar with it. The Fredos Group is a venture capital-backed startup. We're headquartered in Jerusalem, um, and we, we've raised around $100 million to, uh, $100 million to date um, with the idea of bringing freight online and becoming the global freight booking platform. We do this primarily through two businesses. One is a marketplace, Fredos.com, which is kind of like Expedia, but for freight. So if you're an importer wanting to move goods from a factory in China to your business in the US, you can go online, compare rates across different providers, and, uh, and book. And then we have a software business, which is where I work. Um, and we provide softwares to, software to um, carriers and forwarders alike, allowing them to centralize all their pricing, um, sell quicker, and also process bookings. 
our ultimate aim is to complete the entire uh, freight booking network. Okay, so we share um, carriers' um, feeds, uh, information, pricing, and, and booking capabilities with forwarders, who then send them, who then share that same information with um, with shippers. And once shippers uh, book, we then feed that information back to forwarders, and from those forwarders onto carriers, thereby completing the entire cycle. When I was uh, starting out at Freightos uh, about six years ago, one of my first jobs there was working with some of the leading uh, freight forwarders in the world and helping them implement our rate management software across their global operations. And when I'd sit down with executives um, and we talked about the objectives that they were hoping to achieve, these are the kinds of things that we discussed. Right? Um, they'd say, well, I need to make sure that I centralize all my pricing. I need to make sure that my teams have access to these rates. I need to make sure that I, you know, there aren't errors, or I want to be able to quote quicker. Right? All of the, the entire focus around that was internal automation. It was, how do I address my costs? But we're entering a new era now, and external connectivity trumps internal automation. Sorry, there was something wrong with that slide, but essentially it was supposed to say, and external connectivity is where it's all at. And if you, if you look at some of the leading uh, companies these days, right, most of the revenue that they're making is from a platform model. Right? Most of the revenue that leading, these leading companies are making these days are not from products they manufacture, and they're not from services they provide. They're from platforms that they host. Some of you may be familiar with Mark Andreessen's article a decade ago where he talked about how software is eating the world. And I would make the case now for the next decade that platforms are eating the world, right? Platforms are the new, the new normal. Because connecting is so much better, right? If you think about uh, even during, during uh, the pandemic, right? We've all had to, or many of us have had to work from home um, and continue to be collaborative. And when you look at these two very drastic examples, you know, being collaborative in Microsoft Word where you're writing a document, sending it to someone for review, for review they're reviewing it, sending it to someone else, and so on and so forth. Right? It's a very static and siloed process. Or you're working in Google Documents, where everyone is participating, everyone is collaborating, people are sharing, innovating, and creating progress. I certainly know where I would want to be working. So how do we extrapolate what we just saw and talked about into freight? Well, Web Cargo, where I work, the software business of uh, the Freitas Group, had a front row seat to things uh, two years ago uh, at the start of the pandemic. Right? There was um, dropping capacity, right? a, re a huge reduction in capacity because there were far fewer flights flying, and an increase in demand because PPE still needed to be flown around the world. So airlines were faced with a dilemma, um, and they tr did some traditional things like um, you know, charter flights, or, as you can see here on screen, uh, you know, stuff boxes on the top deck of a plane. But that couldn't be the only solution. Our software um, processes rate sheets from airlines on a daily basis. Airlines will send us these rates, um, even at times, you know, during, let's say, normal times, uh, we were, sometimes we were only getting these twice a year during uh, peak season uh, and season changes, sorry. Um, and these rate sheets, you know, they, they may contain hundreds of lanes and, and tons of different prices for, for these different trade lanes. But as soon as the pandemic hit, it completely collapsed. In the best of times, these rates were inaccurate. So suddenly with dropping capacity, increased demand, there was just nothing to do with these sheets. And we saw that. And so, there's really something wrong, I apologize, but um, there was really an opportunity for these companies to take their, um, you know, that internal autom automation and turn it into exter external collaboration. Okay, so if you, um, if you look at this chart, actually the, the airlines that were able to partner with us and share their real-time data, share real-time pricing and real-time capacity on our platform really won out. Over a two-year period, or just over a two-year period, we saw an increase of 22,000% in total number of bookings on our platform. Um, and that's because these, these airlines were able to leverage um, technology in a very quick way. So the next question is, why isn't this happening in ocean freight? Well, for starters, airlines have a big brother, right? Um, the passenger side has been working on this for decades, right? and um, the cargo side can easily turn to this big brother and say, okay, you have the know-how, you have the technology, how can we leverage that? Ocean, people in the ocean space don't have that same luxury. 
Now, don't get me wrong. Some ocean companies are are there. We're seeing、um, some companies like Maersk or Hapag Lloyd really making a big play of、um, their digitization roadmap. Right? So they're they're being very transparent about it. They're really experimenting. They're trying very very different things.、Um, and and again, they're just they're 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 willing to take risks. And on the LCL side, we're also seeing that there are some leading provi- LCL providers or consolidators out there that are, you know, sharing their rates on our platform, like Vanguard or Ecu Line. And、um, and again, they're just they want to experiment, they want to learn, and they're also understanding that it doesn't need to be a marriage for life. They can try it, they can test the waters, they can learn from the experience, and and move on if they need to. And、um, and it kind of reminds me of a, an anecdote I heard from the CEO of a small, relatively small freight forwarder in the States,、uh, who told me、um, who, that he used to have, or he might still have, Google Google alerts set up for、um, all these different tech freight tech words, right? So, for example, digital freight marketplace. Online freight marketplace and so on and so forth, because he wanted to be the, the be the first person to hear about them. He wanted to be the f- first person on them, and he wanted to be the first person learning from them. And you know, it just I think that that's such an interesting example of of how some companies can be really bold about putting themselves out there to learn as much as they can, and also leverage those learnings for their own internal platforms as well. So, what's slowing us down? Well, there's a few reasons why things are a bit slower. Uh, certainly, I think、uh, people in the ocean space like to work in, in more of a siloed environment.、Um, there, there, there are some cultural apprehensions,、uh, which which make things a little bit more difficult. There's large legacy IT systems and IT teams that、uh, you know you need to put to work.、Um, there's also this attempt to fully own customers, as if、uh, shippers or forwarders wouldn't work with multiple. Uh, providers, we know that they do, right? So, but there's still this this attempt to to say I own my customer data and I don't want to expose it or share it.、Um, and then you know there's there's some other factors as well, like conflicting internal processes. So you need to make sure when you're sharing lo- rates on a platform, you need to make sure that if someone calls your local salesperson, that they're not going to get a be- better rate than they're seeing on a platform. If not, it defeats the whole point of that、um, experiment. Right, so there are some things there, and then obviously there's、um, there's a comfort in opacity as well. There's a comfort in in the fact that you're doing things the traditional way and it's been working, and and not wanting to evolve. A couple years ago, Johan Thuz、uh, from DB Schenker said the industry basically exists because of complexities in the supply chain, because there are so many players, and because of a lack of transparency. We need to find a way to make money with and through transparency. So just to you know, wrap up, or I'm, I'm nearly at the end here, but but what I'm trying to get across is it's okay to build things internally, right? But it's so important to expose them externally. If you think about you know, a leading company in the world like Amazon, that's their recipe for success, right? That's exactly what they're doing. They're building things internally, they're perfecting it, and then they're exposing it externally. They're mass marketing it to everyone. Robert Kunin at Air France KLM. Said also a few years ago, our distribution strategy was always based on the principle that you want to be where the customer is.、And、I think that's that's really key. That's the key lesson here: is yes, it's okay to build your own things and have your own roadmap, but be open to hearing where your customers want you to be, not where you think they should be. Thank you very much.、Um, if you have any questions, I'll be around later on. Thanks a lot, Daniel. And、uh, by the way, thanks to all the speakers so far for ma- making the timekeeping very easy for me. That's awesome. The next ones you'll see on stage will be even shorter because they'll only have 90 seconds to speak to you.、Um, there are some of the startups that are applying to be bar- part of the batch that's going to start、um, soon. So just to remind yourself.、Um, Around 100 startups were originally selected by the Plug and Play team and introduced、uh, to the corporate and founding partners.、Um, then we had 20 on site here、um, this morning, pitching, being in tough talks. I know, for example, I sit r- r- right in front of me is Rudy of Euronav, and he's been talking to them. They had more time to pitch. They really wanted to know what could each of the partners get out from a collaboration, for example. Now they have a chance to do an encore, so to say, to those of you who were not there. This morning, so I think、um, for them it's l- it'll be a bit more relaxed now, less adrenaline. They've got done it this morning already, and、um, now we'll have five of them 
for 90 seconds and we'll just weave it in throughout the evening so you get a glimpse of what kind of companies are online to be selected um, for the first batch of plug and play maritime. Um, the first topic we'll have, we group them after topics a little bit, is around green energy sh shipping and uh, decarbonization. Um, that's a tough topic, I think, but some that the industry is eager to embrace. I think Mask just spent 1.4 billion on eight new ships running on green methanol, um, which actually I am from that industry, uh, from renewable energies. I always thought it's about hydrogen there is even green methanol, and that's a completely new market. I know some startups in Germany are trying to produce that methanol for mask now. So this really is also an ecosystem effort. So I'm very excited what kind of solutions our next startups will have. So let's line them up next to stage already, because you only have 90 seconds. Um, once you start pitching, the time is running down. Once your time is up, you will hear that sound. <laughs> Um, are you ready for our first startup? <laughs> Let's have him on stage. Uh, Kano, founder and CEO of Awake.ai. Hello. The mic, um, yes, it should be on now. Hello. Hi. Awake AI is leading the transition to sustainable and intelligent maritime logistics. Uh, we do this in four steps. The first step is collaboration and transparency. For that, we have built the smart port platform, web and mobile applications, and APIs. The second step is optimization and new digital services. We have created the port call optimization, uh, AI-based planning solution, and uh, industry-leading prediction services. Third step is some of these processes will be automated in the future. We have started in three processes. Uh, automating the requested time of arrival and departure, automating computer vision uh, solution that tracks and reports automatically at the yard, and we're automating the buying and selling of port services and products using our marketplace. The fourth step is uh, th some of these processes will be autonomous in the future. For that, we have created a system that manages autonomous vessels to make port calls in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kano. Thanks a lot, Kano. Next up is Mark of FuelSafe. Welcome on stage. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Sima. I'm the CEO of FuelSafe, and we're an energy efficiency enhancement and clean tech company from Germany that have developed a field and lab proven patented solution where we are helping operators to become more profitable while reducing the impact on the environment. We do this by dynamically injecting hydrogen, oxygen, water, and methanol in three different locations of the air intake to increase the combustion efficiency leading to a leaner and cleaner combustion at an optimized stoichiometric mix and ultimately substituting some of the dirty primary fuel against clean fuel alternatives while saving some real net OPEX money taking a full energy balance on a cost basis into account. We have validated this solution for two and a half years on Europe's largest heavy lift crane ship with the world market leader in heavy lift crane shipping and have shown there over 16% in net cost savings only from reduced fuel consumption, not taking other benefits like reduced maintenance or enhanced loop oil lifetime into account. We have furthermore signed then a contract with this company, our first 5 million contract for six ships, 93 megawatt combined engine power, and have also secured a contract with Van Oort for our first DP3 vessel and with Sea Drill for a drill ship in the Bacalo oil field in Brazil. We have validated the solution also in the laboratory of the FVTR in Rostock and are looking forward for lots of interesting conversations and answering a lot of questions that for sure are there. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thanks a lot, Mark. <laughs> Wonderful. Next up is uh, Floris, co-founder and managing director of Onboard. Welcome, Floris. Thank you. Good evening. Um, startup from Rotterdam, proud neighbor of Antwerp. Um, Onboard has developed a digital infrastructure that connects assets and crew at sea. Customers using Onboard have been able to save, uh, to s reduce operational costs with 20% by better planning their operation, reducing waiting time, synchronizing activities within their supply chain, uh, running the vessels with greater efficiency, uh, and making a whole range of fast and objective decisions on a whole range of issues. Um, if this uh, vessel, rich vessel data uh, is, uh, is interesting to you, if you think you can work with this rich uh, vessel data, please visit our website. There you find uh, our uh, API. You can log in straight away. All the information you need is in there. Um, um, and um, 
uh, we can uh, we can start working uh, working tomorrow together. Um, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Flores. So, next up is uh, Philip, co-founder and CEO of Closelink. Welcome on stage, Philip. And take your time. I want to hear the chip horn one time. <laughs> I can't guarantee that. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philippe. I'm CEO and co-founder of Closelink. And with Closelink, we strive to become the leading procurement platform for um, the major ship consumables. Um, our story started, or our journey actually started back in 2017 in Hamburg, in, the, in Germany. And um, today we offer a SaaS-enabled marketplace, or in other words, a procurement platform for shipping companies. Um, our journey started with a procurement platform specifically tailored to the procurement of marine lubricants, which are a leading cost driver for ship, um, technical ship management companies. And in Q1 next year, we're going to extend our platform into the vertical of marine fuels. And as you can see on the board, um, those two consumables make up for the leading cost of running and maintaining a ship. And um, the, um, the, the, the value proposition that we provide is straightforward. Uh, we help companies to reduce manual work and workarounds. And through that, help a company reduce um, company and vessel-specific spend. And the beauty for us about this is it's a market that's actually really untouched and um, um, unconquered yet. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to further questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. <laughs> Next up is George of Ship Reality, co-founder and CEO. Welcome, George. Hello. I'm George Burgos. I'm the CEO of Ship Reality. There is 80,000 ships existing that require a series of modifications for decarbonization and green energy efficiency reasons. Most of these ships do not have any 3D design data. They rely still on 2D PDFs uh, drawings. And at the same time, every time a ship owner needs to do some support, they have to send, or an inspection, they have to send somebody over there to the ship to uh, perform the support function. What we have created is the shipping metaverse, in a sense, where we combine real-time 3D graphics with uh, connectivity that is provided by the mixed reality, the virtual reality and augmented reality. So this type of platform, in a sense, creates a universe, which is a virtual universe that pretty much covers the whole uh, space of the ship. We can do with our own software, 3D CAD design in there. We can create a structure, a 3D structure of a ship using the point clouds from the laser scans. And then we can bring the data in a spatial 3D uh, database. And all these can be shared in real time in virtual reality or mixed reality directly into uh, the frontline workers on the ships to be able to perform their duties. This has been built uh, since 2018. All the software that has been developed is ours. Thank you very much. Thank you, George, for stretching it just for me. Um, that's wonderful. So, um, well, tonight you've already heard um, a lot about what's going on in the Valley and how we try to bring about to life that spirit here. You've heard from some companies who think they have the solution you might need. What's more important now is, of course, to hear from the industry itself, um, from the large corporations in shipping. Um, how do they think? Um, is innovation, uh, do we need to leverage innovation in the maritime industry? What are the obstacles? What are the opportunities? And how do you want to go about it? For that, we'll have a panel now with some of the founding partners, as well as uh, representatives of the um, ecosystem as such. And I'll hand over to Salah for the moderation. Salah, where are oh, you coming from this side? As Thank you. Surprise. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to kick off the, the little panel that we have prepared, and for that I would like to um, ask on stage uh, Helen Schmidt, uh, who is uh, a representative and in charge of innovation, uh, a maritime innovation at the Belgium Ship Owners Association. Hi, Helen. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, second, uh, Alexander Savaris. Um, who is the CEO and uh, uh, one of the family members of the CMB uh, Corporation. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Then Pete Obster, 
who is uh, in charge of um, innovation at the port of Antwerp. And last but not least, Rudi van der Eiken, also group IT manager at Euronav and in charge of the topic of innovation. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time and uh, being here. Um, the idea of the panel in general is it's a short panel. So obviously with four people and uh, one uh, moderator, it's, we, we will not go too much into detail, but please take this as an opportunity of the ideas you hear to continue the conversations later on at the networking dinner. Um, so maybe a couple of topics. Oh, we're missing one. My old boss always told me the five P's in life, proper preparation prevents poor performance. And, uh, so. But going over to, to, the, to the topic of today, we would like to speak a little bit about innovation in general within the maritime industry, about um, the topic of carbon neutrality and sustainability. And number three, um, if, uh, also scratching on the surface on uh, how innovation can have a role within, this, um, within the safety uh, area. Um, so t uh, opening the question, uh, Rudy, um, in general, where do you, where, can you tell us a little bit about your um, or Euronav's innovation roadmap, the, the priorities you see and what you're currently uh, working on? Okay, yeah. I can. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Um, let's say that we as, as Euronav, we started about three years ago. Yeah? Uh, sincerely looking into innovation. Um, we were told to start with small projects. We did it the other way around. We started with the biggest and challenging project ever. Yeah? Um, apart, next to RPA and others, uh, we looked into IoT projects close to our heart, our vessels, yeah? our ship. So we, um, we started with IoT projects, uh, bringing sensor data into the cloud, yeah? building data analytics on it. For us, very important was the collaboration between vessels and shore, mm -hmm. uh, because that's close to our heart. Yeah? And that also filled in the gap of what we call digital transformation. Everybody told us, don't start on innovation if you don't capture your digital transformation. And digital transformation is actually involving your people in the office and on board of your vessels, building those digital solutions together yeah? in an agile way, flexible way, build it up, build up experience, yeah? work on it, even if the project is hard and tough. Yeah? And I must say we're very successful in that. Uh, we are learning every day. Uh, more and more people are involved, both on board of our vessels, master chief engineers, second engineers, but also at shore in our office here in Antwerp, but also in Athens and abroad. So that is actually for us the biggest uh, change we are making at this very moment. So that should be a, a lesson also for the rest of the maritime industry. Yeah? Innovation is nothing without digital transformation as of your organization. Secondly, uh, it's not all ab only about innovation, it's also about changing and optimizing your business processes. So start by changing and optimizing your business processes, build the digital solutions on top of that, yeah? and don't work around. It's not only the tooling, it's also the process, the way of working that is important. Build up that maturity as a company and um, learn step by step and then start evolving other maritime companies tech companies, sh build up that ecosystem, share knowledge, share experiences, and become all better. Okay? Wow. <laughs> what should I, I mean, uh, it's, it's only questions, <laughs> nothing to add. But thank you, yeah, I mean, um, maybe moving over to Helen. Helen, um, Euronav both as well as CMB are members of the Belgian Shipowners Association, and you might have also more than just these two members. In general, what do you see? What do you see uh, in terms from your members, and how do you try to kind of execute on their requests coming in towards you, and on the basically questions even that they might have? I actually think that we're quite lucky as a Shipowners Association that, uh, that we actually have such um, innovative members. Um, our members look, as, as Rudy mentioned, quite far into the future, uh, not only on digital part, but also uh, when it comes to alternative fuels. Uh, there's a big bet on ammonia, hydrogen. Um, but maybe sometimes we, we look a bit too far into the future. Eh? We sometimes forget what we already have. And I think that's uh, especially important as well for the smaller players. They sometimes get a bit lost. Um, there is also so many uh, energy saving technologies that, uh, that, that are going on and uh, I think in the near future there should be also be a strong focus on those 
um, since the alternative fuels, the, the, the green production of those, mm -hmm. the availability at, uh, at, at, at a great scale, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, still a, uh, it's a nice story, but it's still for the future. So I, I, I think that uh, the strong focus for those energy saving technologies is still uh, very important. What a great transition actually to the next topic. Thank you, first of all. Um, I would like to um, uh, ask a question to you, Alex. Um, you yourself, um, entrepreneurial spirit, also having done a lot in the terms of new energies, alternative fuels, trying to really solve this issue that is coming towards you, uh, of uh, not only um, the impact that it's going to have on the planet with these emissions existing in the maritime industry, but also um, the impact that it's having on your, on your uh, company itself, because carbon is going to cost at a certain time. Um, where do you currently see the current low-hanging fruits in this challenge that is for, uh, coming towards you? And uh, can you tell us a little bit and open up and maybe tell the audience what you have been working on in the past? Well, <clears throat> the, the low-hanging fruit, unfortunately, uh, we've uh, eaten them. Uh, we have to look at uh, the fruit that is hanging a bit higher. And, um, and one of these things is that we need to change two things. Uh, one uh, will be independent, uh, but that will be just be the cargo composition. Uh, Euronav and ourselves, we still transport fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And at one day, uh, the portion of the fossil fuels that are being transported globally is going to go down. And uh, we will, of course, need to adapt. But that is not something we can control and not something we can dictate. What we can change, of course, is the way we move our goods through the water and what kind of fuel we use in our engines. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, different fuels that have been looked at. Uh, our conclusion has been, having thought about uh, the different alternatives, that hydrogen and green ammonia mm -hmm. uh, uh, present uh, great opportunities. And then the issue is, how do you bring hydrogen on board of your ship? So we called all the existing engine manufacturers, and everybody told us to use LNG. <laughs> and then we said, we'll do the engines ourselves. And then we thought about, where do we get the hydrogen? And we called all the big shell and totals of this world, and they said, well, wait, it's LNG for the next 20 mm. years, and then we'll produce hydrogen. So then we started producing our own hydrogen. And then at one point, uh, my colleague said, well, if we continue like that, Alex, uh, we will forget about our own business. <laughs> so why don't we reach out to people that actually can assist us? Uh, and that's how actually Plug and Play came about. So I think there's a great connection between the issues we face in our industry and our day-to-day -day business and where we need to get uh, and I de definitely relate uh, with uh, what Daniel said uh, in terms of uh, developing things internally, but keeping an open mind externally to find solutions uh, for the challenges we have. Thank you so much. Um, you were speaking as well, also involving Euronav. Um, your clients are moving and you're moving as well fossil fuels or fossil products. Um, speaking about that, we hear a lot that traders are now looking also towards more um, basically sustainable ways of transporting their goods and the, the specs of a ship are very important also for the trade itself. And um, what, where do you see currently some kind of um, requests or basically how do, do your customers come towards you with this, uh, with this topic of, uh, of sustainability? Well, let's say that the vast majority of our customers, they want us to be green, but they don't want to pay for it. Which, Same problem. which is something we've heard for yeah. the last 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> however, however, I think since 2019, something fundamentally has changed. Uh, and I always give the credits to Greta Thunberg. You like her or you don't. Uh, but she has done what Al Gore has done in 2009, mm -hmm. is basically bring the urgency to the boardroom. Al, Al Gore, he basically taught us what climate warming was and yeah. climate change was. Uh, it br she brought it to the boardroom. And I think everybody here who sits in a boardroom has now a topic on sustainability, decarbonization, ESG, etc. Um, and when you look at where we need to go to now, we basically need to embrace this, talk to our customer, and try to convince him to pay a bit more. Ultimately, it will be all of us having to pay a little bit more for our shoes coming from China, having to pay a little bit more for sustainable fruits or vegetables, uh, because the transportation cost will be a little bit higher. And there's two ways to do that, is either we bring the cost down on the cost curve of renewable energy and all the alternative solutions, yeah. or we bring the cost of carbon up. And of course, this is the center of the debate in the maritime industry right now. I think the customers now want us mm -hmm. to do it. Some customers are now willing to pay a little bit more, but ultimately we'll have to find a solution which is acceptable to the end customer. Thank you. Maybe involving uh, also Helen and Pete in this conversation, also from the association and also from the port, 
Um, how, how does that topic kind of uh, has an effect on you? Um, also interesting from my side, uh, the next generation, do you feel that already or is it is that even not a topic yet, but it's more the now generation, the top the people who are in charge of the business? I think looking to the ports, uh, first of all, uh, the, the role of a port will be crucial in, in, in the whole energy transition uh, because we need to be able to provide the facilities to build that new infrastructure and to build to bunker uh, these ships with, with uh, renewable energy. Um, and, and just a point I would like to make here is, is innovation, it's about doing things. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we heard a lot of nice uh, companies today and sometimes it's, it's early stage. But do things. You learn so much by doing it. And I think CMB, Euronov, or it's really great to have them as, as, as founding partners because the business drive is there. I think our role as a port authority is to facilitate that, be that open innovation platform, ensure that the infrastructure, mm. uh, hard infrastructure, but also digital infrastructure, the processes, that they are present so these people can build their new business around it. Absolutely. I think in general the topic of doing and daring and and also allowing failure is something it's, it, it, it's, we're seeing it a lot uh, and it tends to become also similar biz, biz words, uh, buzzwords like, uh, like blockchain and other when we're talking about tech. Yeah? But I think it's true, it's something that you have to allow. Um, the, the, the failure, allowing to test out, try out and go and look for the right solution, right? Uh, any, any insights you can give us from your members and in general on that topic? Uh, yeah, maybe um, quite short. Even though the customers are not ready to pay for it yet, I think it's quite beautiful that our Belgium ship owners actually already start to make the move forward. Um, and hopefully I, uh, we can also see the banks in the future stepping up a bit. It would uh, also be uh, very helpful, a bit of push. In, uh, in, and yeah, of course, the cost customers, it will start maybe like uh, when you pay online, when you uh, buy a, a, a air an, an, an airplane ticket, you can also have the, the, cho the, the choice to opt for, uh, to pay for your CO2. Maybe in the future, that will be more and more the case as well in shipping as well. Thank you. What we see, um, sustainability is a topic of uh, the future of this planet, future of our lives. Uh, lives have to be protected not only from the climate impact, but also in terms of safety. Um, so, Pete, you have over 60,000 people working at the port every day. The topic of safety at the port facility is, must be tremendous. Can you share a little bit of um, knowledge with us on how you see technology having a role in order to make also the port a safer place? Unfortunately, every year, uh, several people are still dying in, in port operations. Uh, that should really stop. Uh, and technology is, is really a means too. Uh, there is technology available today to help people, to warn people um, in case of, of dangerous situations uh, by having wearables when a forklift is coming too close, uh, when a man is getting overboard, to get a warning there. Um, and also training of people. I think uh, new technologies like VR, we should not underestimate that. Uh, uh, training on fire, um, extensions, you can do that by using a VR because it's, it's a simulation you cannot do in the real world. Uh, methanol, one of our tugboats, will shortly become uh, operating on methanol. It's a new procedure you need to build. Uh, you need to build quality levels onto that, but also to train the people. And you cannot uh, have a real world uh, explosion of, of a, a methanol tank. So by using VR, mm -hmm. you can train people how they should react uh, when something like that is happening. Great. I think this is, uh, this is amazing and this is, is one of the great examples of how technology can facilitate this, this kind of transition also in that area. Um, on board of the ships, I guess it's also, uh, I mean, I guess I know it's also a huge topic. Uh, safety, not only the safety of lives, but also safety in terms of also making sure that the devices or the machines are really handled correctly. Can you share a little bit from your perspective, with you? Yeah. Yeah, for the Euronav, it's also a top priority, safety on board. Yeah. Uh, we are investing a lot in training and yeah, training uh, the people, the crew, but innovation can also play a, a, a big role in that. Uh, we're talking about, uh, as we said, the wearables also on board. We can copy that from already existing technology that we have. Uh, we have uh, AR uh, systems uh, that we can place on doors to check on helmets, to check on safety glasses uh, uh, before crew or crew leaves leaves the hotel. Yeah, it goes on, on board of the deck, uh, the location of the, of the of the people on deck. Yeah, that we can 
know where they are. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, things that we can develop today. We also saw uh, innovations around cameras, bringing data on, on specific parts of the vessel uh, towards the cloud, learn out of that big data, and make sure we can protect the vessels and the people on board of the vessels much more. Yeah? So we are investing in that as well, and it's definitely high priority for us as well. Fantastic. Yeah? Thank you so much for this insight. Anything to add to this? Otherwise, I uh, would really like to thank you for these insights, uh, for this opener, conversation opener. So um, I'm excited to see how we can collaborate on these topics together, how to, we can really prove and show uh, really use cases how technology can have an, an impact on digitalization, innovation as such, on uh, the uh, journey to a greener shipping world, and also on how to make shipping and the port infrastructure way safer than it is currently, with uh, not so any more uh, sci-fi technologies, but real life uh, kind of applications. So thanks so much for the panel, uh, to the panelists for taking the time to be here. Thank you uh, for listening, and uh, please con do the conversation later on during the networking. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Salar. So, uh, we have another pitch session for you. We're already used to it. 90 seconds for each startup, and um, you'll get a glimpse into some of the solutions that are out there already. And that might be interesting for you. We heard a little bit of um, gadgets, smart gadgets, so um, our next um, batch will um, have a look into that because we'll focus on IoT, on big data and smart infrastructure, um, on the digitization of pure paper processes and of course of the digitalization that means working with the data as such. So next up is Christopher, uh, VP Sales at Scout Drone Inspection. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Christopher Skinner. I am the VP of Sales and Business Development at Scout DI. We are a company based in Trondheim, Norway. Um, so we've traveled quite long to get here today. Thank you for the weather. Um, what is important for us? What is the challenge we are going after? It's really related to confined space inspection, hazardous areas, cargo tanks, vessel tanks. And that's the challenge we have taken on. What you can see behind us there is a drone system we have developed, which is built around visual inspection of these, such, of these confined spaces. The main sensor is an RGB camera, and of course it's also built around a LiDAR sensor that allows you to do mapping, navigation, and location tagging within that environment as well. Now, what are the advantages this brings? Often for these confined spaces, you will have to send people into these hazardous environments. You may have to work at height. Um, you may not even get complete data coverage due to these challenges. But we now give you a solution that can be operated from outside the tank, beyond visual line of sight flying. And as a result, our customers are able to do these inspections safer. They can see order of magnitudes improvements in cost, order of magnitudes improvements in asset downtime as well. And lastly, um, they're able to get improved data insights. The second part of our product, which isn't shown here, is the portal, which allows us to then use the data and maintain that situational awareness all the way through to post-inspection. So for us, it's about maintaining situational inspection during the flight, giving the operator the opportunity to do non-entry inspections, and then also... Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christopher. And then now just how a sound technician is really enjoying putting up the volume a little bit more every time. <laughs> so um, our next pitch will come from Rodion. Um, please come on stage, uh, CEO and founder of iGouge. Did I pronounce that correctly first to clarify? iGauge, excuse. Um, yes, sorry for that, but here you go. Hello, I am, my name is Rodion, I'm CEO of iGauge. iGauge proposes a digitalization solution for ship owners and ship operators that helps to save fuel reduce emissions, prevent breakdowns in the middle of the ocean, and reduce maintenance costs. Digitalization, why? Because digitalization is no longer an options requirement, because data is tangible nowadays. However, we all know that this industry is very late in digitalization. And why, when we talk to our customers that say that majority of equipment and machinery on board of a vessel is not digitalized, it's not smart, it does not generate data and at the end it needs to be monitored manually. And manually collected data, like the famous known reports, often contain inaccurate data and they are averaged over time. 
So we at iGate set our mission to simplify digitalization, to make it accessible to many more players and use cases. We have created a cost-efficient digital twin solution powered by artificial intelligence on the edge that collects high frequency and high quality performance and condition data from all equipment on board. And then this data is analyzed on the shore and combined with other sources of data like weather, etc. The advantages of our solution is that it is non-invasive and is compatible with equipment of any type, any make and any age. It's also very cost efficient and can be deployed by the crew during the voyage because any ship can become smart and we know how to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Rodion. Next up is Joffrey of Autonomous Night. Welcome on stage, Joffrey. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Eisenberg. Um, I'm uh, the co-founder and uh, chief knight of uh, Autonomous Knight. Uh, within Autonomous Knight, we develop patented uh, central systems that enable autonomous vessels, both on sea and on inland waterways. Our uh, patented technology, it's a multispectral camera, enables you to, um, is a key enabling technology, excuse me, for the uh, to enable the EU uh, model shift where we want to get uh, freight from the uh, highways onto the waterways. Um, going autonomous solves a couple of, challenge, solves a couple of challenges that uh, the industry is facing today. Um, well, we have the aging uh, crew uh, demographics. There's health and safety issues that we need to, um, um, that we need to face, as well as uh, asset under, under utilization. With the, autonomous, with the autonomous night sensing system, we can increase the energy efficiency. We can eliminate um, operator-induced injuries and accidents. And we can optimize asset utilization, resulting in massive cost and emission savings. When we automate, and I do mean automate, not automate, we can control and we can standardize. When we standardize, we can reliably analyze and predict and when we can reliably predict a multitude of value added of, of value add solutions comes to play, comes available. Sorry for that. Um, autonomous night is really about autom automating dull, dangerous, dirty processes. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Geoffrey. Yes, perfect. So, two more to go in this round. Uh, next up is Bart Adams, founder and CTO of XYZT AI. Welcome, Bart. Oh, yeah, no, please take that one. All right. Uh, hi, all. I'm Bart from XYZT.ai. And we help you get insights out of everything that moves and everything that's being tracked, such as vessels in a port or vessels at sea. Um, we do that by providing a self service analytics platform that allows you to ingest the data yourself, get insights out of the data, and obtain situational awareness. And this can help in uh, looking at efficiency, looking at safety, look at, looking at sustainability in your port or in your operations. Um, we're used by some of the big players in the world, in, in the maritime world, such as Spire Maritime. Um, so please come and talk to us. Uh, we're here with two people. Uh, Nick is also here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Bart. And um, last but not least, um, Alexander for TwinTech. Welcome on stage. Good evening. I'm uh, Alexander Carpentier. I'm the CEO at TwinTech. Um, today, consumers and professionals, they start to expect that every digital, every product comes with a digital experience, either to tell its story or to drive its users towards self-service, to collect feedback from those users, and that for every unique product. Yet, for many products out there, adding sophisticated electronics simply doesn't make sense. And that's where a twin tag comes to the rescue. Um, think of it as a chip without wires or batteries that's internet connected when you need to be. A cloud-based virtual twin with a unique identifier tagged onto a single product to turn it into your best customer communication channel. Tag can be NFC, RFID, a web link, or simply a QR, which is scannable by anyone. And in the maritime ecosystem, 
this product-led communication approach has resulted in a number of industry solutions like anti-counterfeit tags for marine pilot ladders or uh, asset ID tags or blitz logistics for bags of plastic granulates. Um, our SaaS in a sticker platform lets you scale from thousands to millions of product instances and get you to value in days where it might take you months or years otherwise. With teams in, in Belgium, in Antwerp actually, and uh, in the US and India, we definitely operate on a global scale. Looking forward to discussing your product-led communication opportunities. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Alexander. By the way, all startups and all founders you see here on stage will, of course, be there later on at the get-together, and they'll all be in this area. They'll have little tables, and they'll be very happy to talk to you and get to know you. Um, well, that was some exciting solutions, and again, we already broadened the field. We really saw um, shipping as such is ripe for disruption. May it be, as we saw earlier, when it comes to decarbonization, renewable fuels. Um, of course, on the one hand, you're trying to figure it out together. Which way you want to go? Is it pricing CO2? Is it another route? You have legislator breathing down your neck, probably. Um, on the other hand, we saw some exciting drone solutions for inspections the digitalization of paper processes or Excel sheets, and um, yeah, all the way to entering the platform era. It's a lot to handle, um, and it might feel like we heard it earlier in the panel, the low-hanging fruits are long eaten and you have to crack the tougher nuts. Um, so you might at one or the other moment feel like, wow, that transformation, I really could do a little bit without it sometimes. And if you have these moments, just try to find somebody in your network who works for the automotive industry and ask them what they're going through at the moment and about their transformation pressure. So uh, hence, in order to also get inspiration and maybe one or the other learning how to handle that transformation, whom better to ask than somebody who's involved in one of the plug and play automotive verticals in Stuttgart, startup automotive to Bahn about their learnings there, how to best embrace the transformation and how um, to crack those tougher nuts, the not so low hanging fruits and the really disruptive elements. Our next speaker, Sunil Menon, is industry leader for manufacturing at DXC Technology. DXC um, made it its mission to provide um, mission critical IT to companies all around the world and they joined the program a couple of years ago already and really made it their thing to build the bridge between those new young tech companies and their global clients. And uh, Sunil will share a little bit of his experience in Stuttgart. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, on behalf of DXC Plug and Play and the founding partners, uh, let, me wel let me welcome you all to this event. Very happy to be here in person, at least personally for me after a long time to be out with, uh, with people. But very happy to be here. So I'm going to um, basically, as you know, I lead the uh, you know, manufacturing industry in EME and DXC, and I'm based here in uh, Brussels. So I will take some time maybe to first probably not a 90-second pitch, but to talk about DXC. Um, so we are not a startup, but you can consider us as a startup because we, come, we are kind of the oldest startup in some way because we come from Hewlett Packard and CSC, the two companies who came together, along with uh, you know, multiple other acquisitions we have had in the past to become today what we call ourselves as you know, DXC. So what makes us, let's say, one of the strongest IT services and technology players is that we are today providing services to pretty much 50% of the Fortune 500 companies, uh, to, to, to companies like American Airlines, Lloyds Bank, across the different industries who rely on our you know, services to run their mission-critical day-to-day jobs. The other area maybe to, to look at is that we are unique in some way is because we are able to work or provide the services and innovation across the stack that you see. So from talking about uh, within, the, within the world, if you talk about saying running the business, which is you know, running your, uh, your infrastructure operations, cloud, workplace services, workplace services becoming more and more important definitely around what's happening right now in COVID, lots of people working from home, our teams have really come across to really take that challenge and really provide a digital service at scale towards that. 
to that, running the business, to combine that with our experience of changing the business, changing the business of, in terms of changing the business model, providing the digital service to understand your data, get customers you know, sort of insights, change your business model, bring efficiency and innovation, and bridge the gap between just changing the business and running the business to come across and to be able to do both. And that's where we find our sweet spot. So I'm going to also talk a little bit more here about our relationship with plug and play and what we have been doing in the you know, automotive industry. Um, but before we do that, maybe just to talk about you know, why should we bother with some of these things and, and where it comes about. So there are a few realities, and I think it was touched in the, in the, in the, in the you know, panel that we talked here and my conversations with, with some of the places. One of the realities of, of you know, today is that the customer and the customer need is changing, be it B2B or B2C. The way that the customers interact and the kind of you know, services and products they want to consume is, is changing. That's a, that's a reality. Because of that, the business model is going to change. I had some good conversations here about talking about maritime business and the you know, business model in that. That business model is going to change. Now, that change can be, you know, come about and, and you can lead the competition, you know, most probably not by doing some financial architecting, but it's going to be by bringing technology, digitization and innovation. And that brings us to another reality is that now that means that you have to be able to have the software skills, if you like, or the digital skills. You have to have the domain and industry knowledge of the business and you have to be able to really master the change management. So to be able to make that change. And those three things have to come together. Now, that challenge by itself, what we believe is so large that there's no company or an entity that can do it by themselves. They need to adapt an ecosystem. They need to create the ecosystem where there's a win-win-win situation to be able to bring all of those aspects together to create that innovation and bring it to scale and bring it to life. So coming to the part about what we are doing with plug and play, uh, especially in the automotive uh, you know, industry, five years ago, we started our journey with that. We set up, now there are about 32 partners who are part of that entire ecosystem. And when you look at the automotive industry, the challenges are not different. Uh, we, you know, we talked about being sustainable and green. That's very much front and center, like you said, which was, which was in the boardrooms. It is in every company, and that challenge is being met by innovation and by technology. And if you look at, in, in that sense, from, a, from an automotive uh, you know, standpoint, you know, the product is changing. The, the product is becoming autonomous. The link between the hardware and the product and the software and the product, which was close, is becoming you know, separated, is being open. That change is driving that particular innovation. And how then you manufacture that process to bringing you know, efficiency and effective into that process, all of that require new thinking, new skills, new technology, and to do all of that in a sustainable and green fashion. And our experience has been that with the startup Autobahn, as it's called, with these 32 partners, with, with, with you know, partners like Daimler and Porsche, and first and second tier partners like DHL, Bosch, etc., all of them coming together and having these deep dives and these workshops and sessions, bringing their needs where these startups and innovators are, are answering that challenge has proved to be an enormous success. In making that change, and we as DXC, as being the technology providers, are enabling bringing that together and to scale that into real life, because what something works uh, from an innovation standpoint in a lab has to come out in the real world at scale. And we are enabling to bring that journey together. So with that, um, you know, I would like to say that we have our team here, uh, our, our contacts here. We have uh, you know, Alexis, Eric, and Isabel. We're all here, so when you have a chance, please do reach out to them and me for any more questions you have. I'm really looking forward, and personally, I'm really honored to be here in this beautiful city uh, of, uh, of you know, Antwerp to, to be at, the, at one of the most important ports to start the journey of a green and sustainable future with innovation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sonia. 
Yes, Sunil said it. You need to create a win-win-win situation. You really need to make sure that the partners you work with um, get something out of it that only is uh, the recipe for a successful um, participation in such an undertaking here as um, leveraging the whole ecosystem on the innovation platform Plug and Play. So how do you do that? If you're a large corporate, you usually have very hierarchical structures. You have a long, long cycles of decision making. If you literally look at the ship making, I mean, that's an asset that has such a long lifespan, a long planning, a long period um, in order then to really be able to adapt to the speed of a startup. That's quite a challenge. And let's hear it from the founders themselves, um, which kind of experiences they made already with corporates and um, a little bit a how to do how to do guide a one on one um, guide, so to say. Um, how to do business with startups and tech companies. Um, I have three founders here. I can ask about their experience. Please come on stage. Um, Stephen Paulmans, Iman Abdic, and Bart Adams. <laughs> so we actually realized that standing behind the counter in the BMS situation is not so beneficial. We should have rehearsed that. Um, so let's stay in front of it for the moment. Um, yes, um, I think we've already uh, seen one of you guys, uh, Bart, so no need to pitch your company again. Um, but let's just say um, it's quite interesting because you've been at Stanford for a bit. You've worked for a Silicon Valley, oh, for a startup that also has a presence in the Silicon Valley. So I'm looking forward to hear a little bit about that experience as well in our panel session. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so I lived there for a couple of years, um, still at the university at Stanford, and it's through what people say, everyone is an entrepreneur there. Um, everyone is constantly talking about what's the next big thing, what's going to be the next thing. Everyone wants to be, uh, be starting a new business. And people are not afraid to take risks. And I think that's something that is inherent to a startup. You have to take a risk because you build a new business, you have this great idea. You invest all your money in it, your time and effort, and it's about taking risks. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, because yeah. now actually we do have some time. Everybody before us was undercutting their time, so we can stretch the panel a little <laughs> okay. bit. Um, let's introduce um, the guy next to you, Stephen Pullmans, Chief Customer Officer at Nylon. I'll do the pitch for you, Stephen. You can just um, relax and lean back. Um, they offer a cloud-based platform that connects business partners to really share their data across border, and that really takes the current to actually share the data. I guess that's a big obstacle. Um, I'm curious to hear more about that in a bit. Um, yes, they raised 1.3 million. Congrats on that. Um, that's a great investment. And also, interestingly, you worked at the Brussels airport. So correct. you've seen both sides, and that's something we're going to talk about as well. And just maybe to be correct to the real founders, I'm not a founder of the company. All right. Perfect, but your experience still is important. Iman Abdic, CEO at Blinko, um, a Munich-based startup um, that focuses on the automation of manual processes in order to enable Industry 4.0. Um, you've spent some time in Tel Aviv, which is a super interesting ecosystem. I'm curious to hear more about that as well. Um, maybe let's start with a big why. Why do you actually, I mean, all of you are B2B startups, so it's seems logical to, corporate, um, to collaborate with corporates. For example, you have 1.3 million already in your back. What do you need those corporate partners for? Um, they are our customers. We live in the same ecosystem. Uh, and you don't know how much money we need tomorrow. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, but what would you say for you is the main priority? What, in order to create that win-win, um, uh, what really is in for you? I think most important, they are our customers. So we need. Coming from a, from a corporate, I think it's very important that a startup knows how a corporate thinks, how a corporate works, and vice versa. And I think one way or the other, it's very important that we can close the bridge between a startup and, and a corporate. There are very few corporates that really can think uh, sufficiently innovative and as a startup. Uh, all the other ones need support for that. And I think one way or the other, that's why we need to talk to each other and work together. So it's not only about the money, it's about generating the first customers and ob often the companies involved are ideal customers themselves. I prefer them to have the money as a customer than as an investor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, what's your position on this? Yeah, it's true. I think one of the most important things for a startup is um, not only to find product market fit, 
like to really bring something to market that people want, but it's social proof, like the first customers to, and then everything starts rolling. You talk to investors, it gets more easy. You talk, talk to other companies, it gets all more easy. And that's why this collaboration with corporates is so important. Is it important to really have maybe a little bit more than a normal customer relationship to really have that close exchange, that feedback loop? I mean, that's one of the things that's, I mean, they always say fail early and that means you need to put something out there. Are you also dependent on have customers who give you a little bit more leeway and are eager to actually share how your product works? Yeah, that's extremely important. And that's, that's also how we started, for example, with Spire. Uh, it's a satellite company. They're super open, super fast in working with us. Um, they really understand that it's like a pilot type of product, that you're, you're, you're still early on the market. You still want to understand better what their problems are. Um, so yeah, that's definitely super important. And I think it's something that if you want to innovate, you have to have that spirit of like iterating over, a, over an idea together with the startup. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, man, you've actually been part of Plug and Play for four and a half years. Um, what was important for you to be in that program? You could have approached companies also by yourself. So what is it that the program adds on top for you? Right. So um, essentially, when we've been founded uh, a few months later, um, we had a first client coming in. And uh, it happens to be one of the largest automotive companies. And when we wanted to move into procurement process, we realized that it actually takes forever. It's like four or five months we were looking into something like that, like a timeline. So what was really helpful is that actually that partner said, why don't you join Plug and Play and uh, there is a way for us to accelerate that process. So if you're a startup and want to accelerate things on that side, it's extremely useful to be part of these programs because there is a process behind that helps you accelerate things also on your you know, closing deals and uh, having your contract pushing through the procurement department much faster. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a very important aspect. So procurement speed is um, relevant for you. How much, yeah. um, I mean, you already talked a little bit about difference in speed. There you said your customer was really fast. Is that normal? Or is it sometimes a challenge that um, a corporate might have a different it speed? Is, it is a challenge. And I think time is the most precious asset for a startup. Um, you know, startups go through this valley of death. They're just burning, burning money. And the faster you get to market, the better. Um, I'll give you an example. If I send an NDA uh, to a corporate, they would maybe after a week send back an email, well, we cannot use your NDA. We will have to use our NDA. And then you get five pages of an NDA. Uh, you have to go through it. I sign it. Um, if they send me an NDA, it takes me five minutes. I just skip the quickly skip through it, I sign it, send it back. And you have to imagine through the whole process of innovation, you have all these different steps. And if it takes every time two weeks, you're not innovating anymore. It's, mm. it's just delaying. And for startups, it's, it's, it's live or dead. What's your yeah. personal like hacks or tricks to fast track these processes? Because you are dealing with large organizations that have to go through certain hierarchical decision making processes. Um, what would you say? I mean, you've been on both sides. You've worked at Brussels Airport, and they're, they're, they're um, yeah, in charge of the cargo um, division. So yeah. how can you handle it? What's the best trick to get corporates up to speed? I would give a quick answer and say avoid them, but you often can't. Yeah? So um, <laughs> I think that I had the benefit being the corporate and being that first main customer for the company Nalian. Um, if we would have, uh, I still remember asking a little amount of money internally to fund this, this open data sharing platform we built at Brussels Airport. Um, if I would have followed uh, the rules and the company governance, at this moment I would still be waiting to get, a, to get approval. Huh? Luckily, our, our CEO quickly said, no, we don't put money in that. We do not understand it's too, too different for what we are doing. We got a funding from the Flemish government at that time, so we could move forward. Huh? So very often it is, uh, I think, most important, find solutions. Huh? Not always keep on pushing the same bell. If it's not working, there are different ways to do. So is it in Europe, something that I often hear, it's very important that when you have somebody in the co uh, corporation working with you, it's somebody who's able to outstep the hierarchy and is more flexible than he usually would be in his jobs and is able, for example, to directly talk yeah. to the CEO. You need, you need a kind of ambassador inside such a company that can find the bypasses, can make 
make it move forward because if you if you do it from an externally you don't have that that connection internally it becomes really difficult because then you end up in in the, and, and it's also the mindset eh? like you said on the speed in, in a big corporate and again there are governances and you have to respect that sometimes it takes two weeks from finance to get a reply on a, on a certain uh, budget you're making and you reply it's not a two weeks but that's a month time and for a startup a month is completely different than than for a, for a, a big company I always made a comparison if you're a really good Formula One driver but you take that car and you go driving a rally you're losing it's two different jobs and, and that is something you have to respect. So for corporates, understanding that they are different and that a startup is different, I think that is the biggest game changer you can have to, to work together and to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Is it important also to navigate internal company politics? Obviously in companies there's a lot, of, a lot of politics involved. Is that something that as a founder you need to think about? Like to forge alliances within the companies or to navigate those waters? What's your experience there? I mean, there's always politics everywhere. Uh, so um, definitely you have to have a good partner inside the company uh, who's going to support you. He needs to be a driver for the project, someone who's going to be pushing through things. Um, I'd like to just add maybe that um, when you're taking a risk, so to say, and approving a budget or getting a, a budget for a startup, you know, this startup is going to work so hard to deliver. You know, they're not going to be taking this, oh, it's just, you know, another budget here and there. And uh, they're going to be trying to prove their point, bring the value to your company. I think you should really consider um, taking a risk and, you know, getting um, a next startup in instead of uh, getting into the old process and um, wondering what's going to happen a few years down the road. So that's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Like That's about the risk, eh? and I think the same challenge for a startup, they call it an opportunity, and for a corporate, they call it a risk. Just that different angle, oh, you look at something, makes a world of difference. Eh? How big, oh, how important is it to bridge that culture gap? Because it's two different cultures, and it needs to be two, two different cultures, because as you said, it's not the same vehicle. A corporation has to function differently than a startup. But how do you bridge those mind gaps, and uh, what kind of expectation management do you have to do before you start um, working together? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think you really need to think larger than just what you try to innovate. You have to think about the procedures and everything. Um, I've seen big corporates really starting a startup within the company, really buying an office space, um, setting up the office space, hiring a completely new team of people to really innovate, um, and then work in a startup mode. Um, and there's some really great books about it, like the Lean Startup, for example. It's, it's, it's not just for startups, it's for corporates also. So um, get into that mindset. Um, and indeed, as, as you told, as you said, like if you work with a startup, they will work day and night for you um, because they want to get there and they want to make sure that, that it succeeds. What was like your aha moment where you're like, wow, okay, I need to adapt to that culture? Did you to the corporate, but I came from the corporate culture also. I, I, I escaped it, so <laughs> that's why I, I, I worked there for like 10 that's years. That's an interesting yeah. point as well. I mean, you know, you have somebody in the corporation doing business with you as a startup. They usually also have their own R&D division. How do you manage not that one division starts to work against the others because they're like, hey, why do you get to do these fancy projects? Um, do you, is that something you also have to navigate through when you start to work with the company as an external factor? But again, I think it depends on, on how they look at R&D. Mm -hmm. And because you, you made a good example, I've seen companies who did the same. We're going to uh, create a separate business unit and they are going to do all the innovation, but they put the same governance structure and the same financial reporting on them as for the rest of the company. And then after two years, they are surprised, well, it's not working. Eh? Mm. So it depends on how the company looks at innovation. And I think if you are a startup and there is a healthy mentality, if there is like on to the top level, a culture on innovation, then I think that it, for an external company, it makes it easier to work. If it's really like a, a legacy company with a strong governance, then it doesn't matter what department, then probably you're going to have more problems with legal and finance than you have with R&D. Mm -hmm. So I guess having the courage to really leave 
your usual comfort zone as a corporation, see it as something else that's going to operate at its own speed uh, and make sure it is able to do so. You've been in Tel Aviv um, for some years there. I yes. think they have an amazing ecosystem that's super strong. It's also because they have the military complex working closely together, putting a lot of money in it. Um, are there some things that you think um, we could copy here in Europe um, that you think that they really excel in? Um, well, from top of my head, I have at least two things that are very different. First, I think we are very comfortable here in Europe, in European Union overall. Just imagine you have a lot of convenience. You don't have to worry if there's someone shooting rockets. Uh, you, you don't have to, you know, in, in Tel Aviv and in Israel in general, everyone's obliged to go to the army. So men, women, everyone, it's everyone's a soldier. So basically, this mindset that they have there is just, uh, it's incredible because um, they are at such a huge pressure. So when they have these windows in between, when there's nothing going on or very little going on, uh, they can fully focus on innovation and really putting themselves into something. And uh, also overall, they are very passionate people, uh, what, I, what I observed. And another thing which I think is extremely important is that their diaspora, which is outside, let's say Europe and the US is very powerful. So, and they don't shy away from putting that money back into their own country, into their own startups, into young entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and that I think makes a massive difference because if you look at the amount of money Tel Aviv attracts and Israel, uh, that's just incredible for such a small country. So if I break it down, yeah. I hope we will not have the same pressure as they do, and I hope the pressure for them eases as well. But uh, what we maybe then should copy is um, being more eager to invest really large amounts of money into young companies. Also, you can create pressure uh, by yourself. You don't mm. need rockets to be shot at you. For example, I killed my car the other, you know, uh, two years ago because I wanted to push uh, myself that I'm thinking more lean uh, in I, you reduce resource in a department because you want them to be more creative how to make more with less you you know you can artificially do a lot of things that's why simulations exist because mm -hmm. you want to simulate certain situation to really push yourself so I'd really advise everyone to try to kind of uh, um, you know play a little bit of an evil boss to yourself and you know <laughs> and actually, things. as a corporation, you can actually play <laughs> evil boss to whoever you choose to deal with the startups. <laughs> okay, there's numerous ways of, doing, of creating pressure. Um, so, but to sum it up, really have the courage to invest uh, large amounts of money into a young, hopefully promising team. Um, really enable them to be outside of the company, not impose your own, um, yeah, structures and processes on them, if need may be, as you said, in procurement. It's great to have a vehicle such as Plug and Play who can help startups to fast track them. Um, maybe last but not least, um, what's your, did Plug and Play help you in the sense of street credibility? That corporates, it's easier for them to find trust into, because you know, a founder team just walks through the door and maybe they're just good at pitching. But um, like, is it great to have like this mediator in between um, that has street credibility that really can assess a young team? I mean, what I observed in our case at least, you know, when you kick off a company, you're essentially looking into a blank sheet of paper. So you have no previous clients, you don't have any trust in the market, you don't have any validation of your product. Uh, so you need to build all that up uh, and that doesn't just come to you. Um, so I think it's very useful to have a place where you can get fast through that process so that you can really get quick feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so i give you an example. Um, our first interaction in the plug and play program was in Startup Autobahn in Stuttgart. And I can tell that after the first batch, uh, we had like four contracts on the table. So for us, that was amazing. You know, just to get started and after a few months of work, there's four contracts with large corporates. Um, and, you know, that really helps startups, I think. Wonderful. I also want to follow the example and undercut our assigned time. So maybe as a last question, because I think that's something that's also very tricky for a corporation. How important is it for them to really also let a startup play around with their data, uh, with maybe even um, their copyrighted um, processes? So 
Is that a challenge for corporates to really let them in into the, like their circle of trust and to have a real look behind the curtains, specifically with you dealing with data? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, it's a very valid and interesting point, and, and I, I think it ties back to one of the speakers before who said innovation doesn't come without digitalization, and that's indeed true. If you want to work with startups, they are like digital. There's, it's all about innovating and so on. Uh, we had a really good experience with uh, Port of Antwerp here. Um, where we uh, approached them and we said, look, we are making this platform to get insights out of everything that moves. Um, you for sure are sitting on data or you're tracking data. And I was really surprised that they had already set up a, a, a big cloud architecture. They dumped all the data already for a couple of years. Um, they could just give me uh, access to that platform in, in a couple of days. And that's really enjoyable for a startup because the data was there. They already had like cloud technologies using. Uh, they had the data science team. So that was extremely useful for us. And, uh, and that's what you say if you are building software to process data, you want to do it on real data, not on simulated or fake data. And that's how we, we got access uh, on like a year of vessel movement in the port, which is extremely valuable um, to test your algorithms to verify what you, what you are building. Mm -hmm. So that's also definitely a good point to, to take into account if you start reaching out for innovation to startups, make sure that you're already somewhere with providing access to what you have uh, in your company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks a lot to the three of you, um, Irma and Steven and Bart, for coming here on stage, sharing your experience. I know you're also around later on. And actually, I think I get to keep you, um, Bart, on stage um, because you'll also... No, yes, uh, Steven, I'll keep you on stage. No? Oh, man. <laughs> then there's only one left, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yes, Irman, you all could stay on stage. Wonderful. Um, we got that covered. Um, you'll also get to pitch um, because we have uh, one more group coming up and they'll all pitch around the topics of safety, inspection and cyber security. The last one being particularly interesting. Um, oh. Yes, we sorted that perfect. Um, cybersecurity obviously is a big topic. It's one that's often um, easily underestimated, um, but it even can happen to the most um, techie of companies. I know in Europe it hasn't gathered so much attention, but maybe you've heard of Revil, the um, very evil Russian hacker group, and they were able to really hack Acer. So like a tech company. They were able to really down <laughs> supermarkets all around the world. They were able to um, hack into pipelines in the US. So cybersecurity is one of the topics that really needs to be on the radar. But safety and inspection are also related with a different angle. So I'm curious to see what kind of uh, solutions our next startups have. You're next. Thank you. All right, so as you know, my name is Erman, and um, well, I heard a lot of problems today in the morning when I was talking with uh, maritime companies, uh, mostly related to uh, how to solve problems with efficiency of moving ships around, detecting currents, changes, uh, not to have delays and increased consumptions. So, um, and that's why um, I think I asked them, why don't you just purchase a solution on market? And everyone told me, well, there's no solution for a specific problem we are having. And that's why we built the platform, which is called BlinkoGo. And BlinkoGo platform provides you building blocks you need to build your own solution with AI. So you can connect to existing sensors, you have algorithms, everything packaged, so you can use them without coding. That's going to enable you to customize use cases that you have and solve your real problems. Not to seek for existing solutions on the market, but rather just do it yourself. And I think we also heard today shipping companies already started building their own engines, producing their own hydrogen. Why not using also a platform that's going to give you your own AI? And we'll, we're going to keep it up to date. Um, and uh, clean for you so that you can use it and benefit and don't have to worry about maintenance. So, thanks. Thanks a lot, Erman, for being cool. And now we have Daniel for CyberOwl. Welcome on stage, Daniel. 
Let me give you that microphone here. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Dan here from Cyber Owl. Uh, whether it's net zero or whether it's crew safety or whether it's um, uh, cost efficiency, we're going to need to connect our vessels up a lot more and put, vessel, and put data, bring data back on shore and push data back out into the vessels more. And a lot of this is uh, hampered by the fact that fleet operators just uh, aren't sure that they've got assurance on the cyber security of their vessel systems. And so at Cyber Owl, we help fleet operators with that, and we do three things. The first is we help you understand what you have on board, how they're connected, and how the data flows through. The second is we help you secure it, and the third is we help you prove that you've secured it to a vetting inspector, to your insurer. Let me finish with a story. Uh, two years ago, when we were first launching the product, one of our customers um, uh, had, uh, they worked very closely with their firewall operators. And accidentally, from human error, one of the suppliers had changed the firewall settings, so they had one vessel's IP address connected to the entire fleet. In that moment, if a piece of malware had started on a single vessel, it would have wormed its way right across the entire fleet. These are the kinds of questions that insurers ask us. Can we have whole fleet level accidents? Now imagine if you've got visibility of your setup and your configuration in your vessels. That's what we do. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Last but not least for tonight, the last startup on stage, uh, DMEC with last pitching. Here you are. Perfect. Chairman of the board. Welcome on stage, Lars. Thank you. Before the 90 seconds starts, I would say that this is the last presentation, so just keep awake now. <laughs> My name is Lars-Johan Frigstein. I'm the chairman of DMEC, the Norwegian company. Um, we are all aware of the digitalization going on in most industries these days. Also for the shipping industry, but to, not to the same extent. One of the reasons are that uh, uh, there are challenging, uh, challenges uh, transferring data on board uh, in steel environments uh, without cabling the entire vessels. Um, so one of the consequences is that, for instance, if you have an emergency at sea, you need to evacuate the uh, personnel on board. You don't know where people are. You can't see them. You have to trace them and find them. So DMIC has actually developed a communication platform on board vessels. We can communicate in steel environments. On, that enables actually the future digitalization of the maritime industry, as well as IoT. In addition, we have developed uh, the next generation of safety system, which is uh, uh, which is uh, actually a system where you can see people in real time moving in emergency situations. And we have man overboard. Uh... Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lars. So that was um, some of the startups that pitched this morning, and some of those startups most likely will be part of the first batch of Plug and Play Maritime, which we don't know tonight, but we'll find out soon. So best of luck to all of you. Um, well, startups also need a playground, literally, to put things into action if they're hardware-based, to showcase them, and to see if their setups, their ideas really work in practice. Um, we heard a lot around tonight about decarbonization and electrification, also a lot of other topics. One of the big topics that is coming up slowly this year after sustainability on a uh, bigger level is um, the circular economy. You hear more about it, you hear corporates talking about it. It's like one of those buzzwords just on the rise. And also on the EU level, it's uh, more and more in focus. How can we really create um, products uh, with um, their parts being able to to be fully recycled, specifically when it comes to batteries, it's super important around raw materials. And that's something that needs to be put into practice um, with all the yeah, stakeholders involved. And that is exactly uh, what the Port of Antwerp is doing with a dedicated area here in Antwerp. It's called Next Gen. And uh, there they really have the chance to showcase these things, to try them out live there. And Marlene Ramakas is the sustainable transition expert, and she's here to tell us a little bit about it. Welcome, Marlene.
Good evening, everyone. Um, imagine your technology has outgrown the lab and is ready to be tested on a larger scale and into an industrial environment. But then you think, what now? How can I bring my innovative and circular product or process quickly to the market? How can I find the right partners and customers? Well, Next Gen Demo can help with that. That's the place located on Next Gen District, a circular hotspot uh, in the middle of the Antwerp industrial cluster. It's a place where demo projects have the space to test and grow in a safe environment. A place where new technology can find its way into the exciting network of the port and industry. With Next Gen Demo, we want to support innovation and we want to um, stimulate industrial proof of concept so we can make the transition to a circular economy. And it's our goal um, to help circular pioneers to bridge the high-risk stage before commercialization by providing a location with shared infrastructure, support services and an ecosystem. Technology providers and investors can bypass the typical scale disadvantages when they want to take their project to the next level. So Next Gen Demo should accommodate about 10 parties. Uh, it will be an open air test facility where both utilities and facilities can be shared between the different demonstrators, but also with the rest of Next Gen District. And its purpose is, of course, to reduce the investment costs for the uh, demonstrators. In addition to lowering these uh, investment costs, we also want to further lower the threshold uh, by uh, giving them assistance with, for example, permits, uh, looking for funding or setting up uh, partnerships. And an ecosystem should give the demonstrators the necessary visibility uh, and also has to encourage uh, the exchange of knowledge and resources not only uh, within the next-gen district, but within the entire port community and beyond. So next-gen demo is the last step a starting technology has to take before it can be commercialized. So what kind of demo projects are we looking for? We're focusing on industrial, circular and carbon smart technologies with a TRL level of uh, 6 to 8, and we specifically focusing on uh, bio-based technologies, waste to chemicals and fuels, CCU technologies, and uh, the storage of renewable energy. So to end my pitch, I want to highlight um, the advantages of Next Gen Demo. So next to the physical space, there are uh, three other advantages. The first is support. We support you in applying for permits and subsidies, but we also uh, provide the necessary utilities uh, to, get you, um, to get you started quickly. Um, and two is the network. So at Next Gen Demo, you are part of a network with worldwide top players, which is ideal to get in touch with the uh, right partners and customers. And three is uh, pioneering. So Next Gen Demo is located in a prime logistics location um, that pushes boundaries with innovations to make uh, the port greener, which is the basis for interesting and sustainable investments. So Next Gen Demo supports innovative and circular uh, companies and organizations so they can focus on developing and scaling up their technology, um, the technologies that can realize um, the transition to a sustainable port. So do you want to help uh, shape Next Gen Demo with your uh, innovative and circular demo project? or you just want to know more about it, uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with me. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Marlene. I just have to ask you, because I'm not from the industry, what's in TRL 6 to 8? A technology readiness level, excuse me. <laughs> and what does that mean? Uh, that's how mature your technology is. So the TRL uh, scale typically goes from 1 to 9, uh, which, which 1 is just the ID and uh, 9 is the commercial scale. So we're typically looking for projects that need the last push or the last uh, step to get commercialized. Perfect. I have one more uh, for my vocabulary tonight. You mentioned CCU. I think that's carbon capture carbon and utilization. Capture and utilization the indeed. U is not so often. I think usually it's about capturing the um, carbon and putting it in, away in the earth. So what's the utilization for? Uh, utilization is um, yeah, just uh, putting the CO2 back into molecules, so reusing it. Uh, instead of just storing it underground, you use it to make new chemicals again. Or renewable fuels yeah. or such. Renewable Perfect. Fuels. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. So an exciting demo site we ha already have here in the port of Antwerp. Um, I guess in the last two years, we all kind of surprised ourselves how much we can do remotely from the home office and how much of the work and also the teamwork we usually do and we never thought is uh, possible to do remotely is possible to actually do in a digital way. But I think mostly that's organizing, that's executing when it comes to innovation, being creative and having those chance encounters, running into colleagues in the cafeteria. Sometimes you actually do need a physical space to have your team to come together, to have those serendipity moments, to also build things with your hand, to build prototypes. And that's exactly um, what Bart Hübrechts, Managing Director of Maritime Campus Antwerp, is involved in. They are creating one of the fanciest places um, here in Antwerp to bring together startups, corporates and teams to really build things together, to be creative, to have a 3D printer around the corner, a workshop. It is absolutely fascinating and it will be probably a great addition to the already beautiful architecture you have here. So um, let's hear more about it from Bart. Thank you very, mu very much. I don't uh, need to add that much because you already did my pitch and sold my project. Uh, but anyway, um, I would like, on, on behalf of MCA, I would like to welcome uh, Plug and Play to Antwerp. And now I hear some people say MC what, MC how, MC why. Uh, Maritime Campus Antwerp. Uh, you can also find us on maritimecampusantwerp.com and in short, uh, in a few weeks, also mca.be. That's uh, much faster and, and uh, so to go. What is MCA? It's an initiative, it's a prize initiative, and we like to tend it to be a little uh, over the top and say it's the beating heart of maritime Europe. What drives us? We want to strengthen the European and global maritime industry. Briefly, we want to create scale and scope. There are things, challenges that we can face, CMB for instance, hydrogen, but we cannot face everything by ourselves and we need scale, uh, we need scope, we need money, we need effort, we need people to do so. So that's one of the things that we want to uh, do. The things we go for, yeah, you heard them all before uh, today, um, clean, efficient, we need good economics and we need to make money within the maritime industry. And we also have to be able to pay for all the clean, uh, the clean technology that we will be providing over the next centuries. What we also want to do is keep and attract know-how to us, to the industry, to uh, also Antwerp, Belgium, Europe, and unite them, corporates with scale-ups, with startups. We have a lot of research companies, we have a lot of people involved in research, R&D, innovation. Uh, why uh, let them go away to somewhere uh, uh, in, in the world? Why not just keep them here, offer them a good solution, offer them good corporates, offer them a good environment where they can work together with us. And the last thing, and that's also something very important for us, and I didn't hear that today, is the war for talent. Maritime industry is becoming more and more digital. Where are the ICTers that we need to do so in the next decades? Uh, where are the people, the engineers, that are not working on our engines, but also working on 
uh, different kind of, of appliances, a different kind of setups that we need to secure uh, our vessels, etc., etc. So that are the things that drive us. At MCA, we have an industry focus. We're not focusing on a technology, because and in the end, everything has to be delivered on those blocks of steel floating around somewhere in the ocean, and that's a tight space, and you need to combine everything there. So that also means that um, we do not have to look at our industry ourselves. We can look at other, industry, other industries. We heard the automotive industry, uh, smart cities, health. There are a lot of industries already further ahead in technology transition. So let's do also tech transfer, next door, or real R&D. And we're not only looking at corporates, we're not only looking at startups, we're looking at the full triple helix, quadruple helix, or quintuple helix, however you will call it, of all stakeholders getting them involved and getting them together. The challenges are industry-based, so you can uh, take any one of those topics and imagine a lot of new technologies that have to be developed for every, other, every one of those challenges. How does it translate? because I now a philosophy, some kind of vision that I, I propose. Well, we will build a campus. And I think, uh, thank you for uh, sharing our overwhelming uh, happiness that we can present to you this kind of building and this kind of architecture. Uh, we will open it in 2024. It will be a start about uh, 40,000 square meters, uh, also here in the south of Antwerp, where corporates, um, and startups, researchers, and all stakeholders of the, of the maritime industry can come together. We'll have R&D infrastructure, big halls, 3,000 square meters, 4,000 square meters. Heavy R&D uh, infrastructure will be in place. Medium, light R&D, we can talk about that later what we mean with that. Uh, but we also have our digital labs, uh, co-working spaces, co-creation spaces, and everything that you need for corporates, for startups, for one day, up to 20 years, for one pe person, up to a, a group of 400 or 500 uh, people in, in your corporate or scale-up uh, infrastructure. Just come there and you will be surrounded by maritime. Just building uh, some bricks, one on top of each other, won't make people more innovative. So we also want to kick asses and say to people, you need to innovate, you want to innovate, talk to that guy, you, get, uh, you got to get in contact with those people and really start also uh, defining the challenges that you can join and where you, where you also need the scale and scope to start innovating. And that's why we also need a community, we're working on that community and that's one of the many stakeholders in what we call then maritime innovation system, or ecosystem. I think we heard about ecosystem about uh, 28 times uh, this evening. But to, to really start innovating, you need to get the people together, and we will contribute with our community, MCA community, also starting later this year. And there also is the, the fit with plug and play. And that's the reason why we are so happy that we could uh, get plug, uh, plug and play to Antwerp. It's really our accelerator uh, platform that triggers uh, startups and scale-ups to come to Antwerp, to come to Europe, and get into interaction with the big corporates. And another thing, do we have to wait until 2024 before we open our campus? No. Um, we are not yet open, but the 2nd of December this year uh, at the Gerlaschka here in Antwerp, Antwerp uh, I think uh, two and a half kilometers south, we will open a co-working meeting center, co-creation uh, space, let's say a clubhouse for the community, and all already a pre preview of what the Maritime Campus in 2024 will be. So I would like to give you some uh, a short glance of what uh, you might if that works here. Yeah, it does. Okay, so 
Yes, Jorn, I will wrap it up. Um, so let's get involved with MCA community. Uh, we invite you to contact Deepak. If you want to know about more about the campus or the labs, contact uh, us. And yeah, I also uh, I would like to invite you to join this effort of MCA and make innovation in the maritime industry happen. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Barrett. Well, we have one last um, round to go here on stage, and uh, that is that we really want to gather all the founding partners here on stage that are the driving force behind um, Plug and Play Maritime, uh, and to have them one co time collectively here on stage. And for that, of course, I want to invite Salar and David back on stage in order to introduce them properly. work yes perfect uh, yes before we end uh, our today's session and before we let you enjoy uh, the beers and the, the dinner uh, we would like to do two things you would like to ask our founding partners to come on stage um, and also take a nice photo uh, of you and also with the the uh, audience today um, and we also had a, have a little present from Silicon Valley so to say so I would ask Alexander um, Shaq um, also Hugo uh, Alexi um, and uh, I think Joris uh, to come on stage uh, to join us here, and Salar is handing out our little greetings from Silicon Valley. And maybe we can turn off the beamer so we can also take a proper picture and without having the lights in our faces. Yes, we'll do that, that from the work, front here. That would be amazing. Yes, our technician is coming to turn off the beamer. Beamer, by the way, is the German word for projector. Uh, um, that, that <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for that. We thought it's English yeah. until we realized nobody understands yeah. it. And uh, no more words from our side. We, of course, uh, like to thank our founding partners, of course, for the support, for the dedication for this project. Without them, it wouldn't be possible to launch this, uh, this project. Uh, and thanks and, uh, thanks and a round of applause to our founding partners. Thank you so much. <laughs> Now I'll just keep you one second uh, longer because one of you de gets to do the honor of tonight. Before I get there, the most important information for tonight, free drinks are in that direction. Um, all our founders that you saw on stage and a couple more will be out there at the tables waiting for you, very eager to meet you, to hear what you already are working on and how you could join forces. Um, we'll serve dinner, uh, so there'll be flying dinner um, throughout the event. Some greetings, by the way, to our viewers on YouTube. Thanks for being with us um, throughout this whole session. It's a shame you can't join us for dinner. I wish you a lovely evening as well. Uh, greetings out to the stream. So in just um, a couple of seconds, you'll have to make a tough decision. Is it the first at the table talk to the founders or the first at the bar <laughs> skipping the queue? Um, you have a little bit of time to make up your mind. Before we do that, we really officially want to kick off plug and play maritime here in Antwerp. We have this little ship bell that we do not know where it was stolen from, but I think we imported it from Hamburg. So one of you gets to do the honor officially, um, start the after party of the kickoff, <laughs> and to help us launch Plug and Play Maritime in Antwerp. I suggest, I suggest uh, we give the honor to Jacques, because he's the real boss, and he's the real landlord of all the companies that are working in the port. <laughs> <laughs> Jacques, <laughs> thank you. So, Ladies and gentlemen, Black and Play Maritime is officially leaving port. Enjoy the evening.